Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Q4 Market Outlook. My name is Anthony Palmer, Group Commercial Director for Carrick, and I'm joined by the familiar face of Rob Enslin, Portfolio Manager at Link Investment Advisors. Rob, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, we're going to spend the, the time really to look at what's happened in the markets. It's been a very, very difficult time, as everyone's aware of, although a lot of our clients don't necessarily know just how severe this pullback has been. So Rob's going to walk us through that, as well as headwinds that we're facing in the markets um, um, and what our outlook and market positioning is. So um, Rob, if you wouldn't mind leading us through. Thank you, and and, uh, it's, and all the audience, thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. I think from my side, it's certainly been a far more challenging year, and I think these opportunities to just convey some of the information and hopefully provide you with some comfort as to what to expect going forward, uh, I obviously value as a team. So with that, I, as Ant alluded to, certainly been a, a difficult year to date. Um, from an equity point of view, we've seen markets down significantly. I would caveat that with the point that your equity behavior, although it's not comfortable for clients, is not unusual in terms of what we've witnessed here today. What has certainly made this year unique is that in tandem, the bond market has sold off aggressively. So really what that has meant for many clients, both clients in cautious balance and growth portfolios, that you're seeing double digit negative returns in your portfolios. And just to, to conceptualize what I'm really saying is what we're looking at here is a chart that just takes each calendar year's performance and it looks at it both from a bond perspective and from an equity perspective. So on the axis on the left-hand side, you'll see just over each calendar year since uh, the 1970s, what equity markets have done each year. And then at the bottom axis, you can see what the bond market's done. And what stands out is that 2022 is in its own very strange quadrant. Uh, often what has happened in the past is when equities have tended to, to underperform, you've been somewhat sheltered from your bond uh, allocation in your portfolio. There's only been three times over that period where both bonds and equities have been negative. The other two times, one would argue that the, it's been a mild uh, negative. So you'll see in 2015, bonds were down around sort of 8% odd, whilst your equities were flat. And then again in 2018, your equities were down sort of 10, 12 percent odd, but your bonds were sort of, sort of flat. This time around, we're talking about 20 percent odd in both directions. So I think that takes us to the next question. And obviously, the, the world at the moment is a complex place. There's a lot of information um, driving markets. But I think the key behind that and the, the single most important reason for the sell-off that we've witnessed lies in central banks. Uh, I think in our past few communications with you, we've spoken about this pivot by central banks, um, and that certainly played out probably a lot more aggressively than what we would have all anticipated. Just to remind everyone, as late as November last year, the Fed and the likes were talking about very mild interest rate hiking regime, we're talking about 25 basis points potential hike for 2022. We've seen anything but that. I think as inflation has become de-anchored and central banks have become a lot more concerned about inflation becoming structurally entrenched in, in, in economies, they've moved ahead aggressively with quantitative tightening. Um, and I think the chart on the left-hand side just gives you an idea at how quickly they've changed direction and at what velocity they've changed direction. So the total X looks at the G7 large economies of the world and really from that very accommodative environment because of COVID that they introduced to the markets to swinging it around completely in the opposite direction. And that has coincided exactly with the market's behavior. So the chart on the right has inverted the bond market. So as interest rates have gone up and inflation concerns have increased, so has the bond market yields gone up. And if you invert that and you correlate that to the S&P 500, there's almost a step-for-step -step behavior in the market right now. So that really just leads to where to from here. And we'll, we'll certainly try and unpack some of those thoughts later on in the presentation. But as a market, what we're looking for is, are we seeing an end in sight with regards to inflation? Or are we seeing a slowdown in economic activity that will be severe enough for central banks to pause? And therefore, less interest rates and, and sort of the stabilization of there will, will mean all things equal, some stability for markets. 
So just to give a little bit more color to what we spoke about in terms of that drawdown, if we look at the broad building blocks uh, within a portfolio of construction, uh, starting with emerging markets, uh, equities at the top, down around 27% odd, developed markets represented by the MSCI world, down 25% odd. And underlying that is obviously we've got the three broad styles, the likes of growth, quality, and value. Now, relatively speaking, over this year, quality style investment managers have outperformed the likes of growth and quality. So they're down 18 in terms of value, where the likes of your growth managers are down 32 odd percent, your quality managers down 29 percent. We do, however, and I point you to the 10 year number, have to have a balanced view in our portfolio construction. Much as over the short period, the value has outperformed, and there could, very, there could be reasons for the next couple of years that they continue to outperform. We take the last 10 years, um, your sort of growth and quality managers have achieved an annualized return, including this drawdown of around nine and a half and, and higher percent, where your value managers have done just north of 6% annualized return. I also alluded to the bond markets. If you look at the World Government Bond Index, that's down a significant 20%. If you just think of the risk profile of bonds and um, the magnitude of that sell-off is, is in territory that we probably last saw in the 70s. Uh, if you look at your corporate bonds down around 18 and then your emerging market bonds down 23%. In summary, the only two places to have protect capital in this environment year to date has been in cash and in physical commodities. The physical commodity index is up 21% largely driven by supply constraints and then amplified by the russian ukrainian tensions on energy and soft commodities and then cash as one would have anticipated uh, returning 94 basis points um, same points on the commodities as much as it would have been nice to have commodity exposure for those who had a lot of it would have done well the challenge though is over long periods of time they tend to be quite unreliable in terms of producing real returns for clients so over an annualized 10-year period including the rebound that we've seen, we've actually lost money at around 4% per year for clients. So we'll get into it a little later, but our, our, our message to clients is these drawdowns are short-term focused. And obviously, if you're going to spend too much time focusing on them in your portfolio, uh, the anxiety and the poor decision-making will come through. You need to focus on the longer-term ability of these asset classes and ensure that you are appropriately diversified across them, depending on your mandate. I think just finally, just to round things off, um, if we look at balanced portfolios, I made the, the comment earlier, um, I think for, for clients who are in a balanced mandate, you are rightfully concerned. I think the drawdowns that, that we've experienced are not normal behavior. And really, if we just look at a classic 60-40 portfolio, which is your pure definition of a balanced portfolio, and we attribute it over a 100-odd year period, um, we're in a, in, a, in a space that we, we seldom find ourselves. I think the late 1920s was an example of that but in an annualized return we've still got a couple of months to go we're looking at a drawdown of around 30 percent in, in, in a balanced portfolio so that certainly stands out my only encouraging sort of message in here is that over that 100 year period your annualized return in a balanced portfolio has been nine percent in us dollars and almost the, the probability of that 9%, as you can see by those bar charts, is certainly in favor of positive returns as opposed to these drawdowns. So I think from there, I'm going to jump into just some of the global macroeconomics. As I mentioned, there's a lot going on in the world, but I think let's focus on the key drivers behind that uh, and, and just some thoughts in that regard. So it's a chart that's really been up in the last two or three presentations that I've done in terms of the scales of justice. On the one hand, we've got um, inflation concerns uh, and, and central banks' responses in that regard. And on the right-hand side, we've got what is economic growth going to look like uh, going forward? Because ultimately, as you hike interest rates and you tighten uh, economies, there will be an offset, whether that be from a growth perspective or from a sentiment perspective. I think round one, i.e. this year, has certainly gone to, to inflation. Inflation has dominated. It's remained a lot more persistent um, and entrenched than many of us would have anticipated. We just need to be aware of interest rates tend to show themselves up in economic activity 12 to 18 months later. So given the speed at which and the, the velocity at which interest rates have been hiked, particularly in developed markets, only time will tell the economic impacts of that. And originally, I think 
particularly the Fed and, and, and compared to what markets views were, was out of balance. The Fed's perfect Goldilocks would be to get inflation, what they referred to as the bedrock of the economy, below 2%, without significant scarring to economic activity in the economy. They actually had a positive Q4 2023 GDP outlook. As time has marched on, I think the market has become a little bit more appreciative of inflation. At the same time, the Fed in their last communications with us have acknowledged that there will be some um, negative effects of the interest rates that they're passing by, whether that be from unemployment, economic activity, et cetera. On the point of, of inflation, um, markets go through these periods in a normal stable environment, fundamentals are far more important to valuations like equities, et cetera. And then we go through these transitional periods that we're going through right now, where almost the macro top-down sentiment is a far bigger uh, sway on market behavior over the short run. I think the chart in the middle there just represents where the market over time has anticipated the US Fed's fund rate to be by 2023. We went through this period in July where we received some poor economic data from the US, the second quarter of negative GDP growth. We also received some negative manufacturing data. And the, the, the read through by the market was, well, we are starting to see some fragility in terms of economics, and therefore the Fed is likely to pause. And we had this July rally in the market where indices were up seven, even some indices up 11 odd percent. Following on from that, I think the Fed has made it quite clear that their mandate to get inflation below that 2% that I spoke about is their core function. Uh, they had a very aggressive sort of focus tone to them over the last two months, whether that be at Jackson Hole or post uh, the last interest rate meeting. And the market has now moved the expectation for 2023 to around 45 4.7% from the US perspective. Um, so they've pushed through around 3% interest rates already this year. Do we see another 275 basis points? The only takeaway from, a, from an investor perspective is that, you know, we're getting closer to a point where the Fed has gone way beyond what is neutral. Um, so each time they hike interest rates and the market has already priced that into the expectations. So we could very well get to a point where the market's overpriced in what interest rates are going to look like. And that acts almost in reverse as a stimulus towards markets if we get anything less than that. It's probably worth all just spending a couple of minutes on, on inflation. We tend to keep focusing on the US because what we are seeing is that most central banks are responding to whatever the US is doing. So even uh, in a South African context, we've seen the, the Reserve Bank uh, sort of plan their interest rate decision one day after the UK is following what... Um, the US is doing. So a lot of the conversation today is US focused, but it is dominating the global scene at the moment. So as a very high level takeaway, US inflation is coming down. So headline inflation in June was 9.1%, July was 8.5%, August 8.3%, and the last print we got now was 8.2%. So that the trend is down, but it's certainly not rapid enough. Uh, and it's been a very slow grind down. And in absolute terms, those are very high inflation rates. What has become far more important to the market in recent months is to not look at headline inflation, because headline inflation includes food and energy, and we know that the energy market has been all over the place, Russia and now OPEC cutting uh, oil production, etc. Core inflation, which strips out those two components and gives you a far better indication of real economic activity, is being closely watched. And unfortunately, Poor inflation is not turning the corner. In fact, it's accelerated the last two prints. And that is what's got the market quite concerned. At the same token, why the Fed continues to say we have to get inflation under control before it becomes de-anchored. Yeah, just one last little piece I just want to share is that, you know, we've said a lot about the, the, the speed of interest rate hikes. Hopefully the chart in the bottom left gives you just an indication. The, the amount of interest rate hikes that central banks, including the Fed, have put on is not unusual. It's just the speed at which they've done it. So that's represented by that small worm-like looking black uh, bar at the bottom. Uh, and just to put it in context, I mean, you look at the, the likes of the US, they've added 3% interest rate hikes year to date. Uh, the United Kingdom, 2%. Europe's in a little bit more of a tougher predicament. 
given the very poor economic backdrop that they're facing, which again has been amplified by the war taking place on their continent, they've only managed to put through 1.25%. The two standouts, Turkey, uh, they're on their own trajectory there. They've been cutting interest rates whilst inflation is completely out of control. But the one of more interest to us is actually China. China is in a very different place in the economic cycle, and they have room to cut interest rates, and they have done so by a mere only 15 basis points. The market, some market participants would have uh, expected more. But the point there is that they're in a different place in the cycle, and the ability to cut is quite different in that regard. Yeah, so just reminding you of that earlier slide of the scales of justice, I think what becomes a far more important talking point in 2023 is economic growth. This year has been about inflation. I think there's some signs of, of the scarring of high interest rates starting to take place, particularly in the housing market in the UK. Same goes for the US. Uh, but if we look at it broadly and we look at some leading indicators, first and foremost, we look at the composite leading indicator of the G7 economies of the world. That has certainly showed signs of turning direction um, towards the end of the last three months or so. From a, um, from a central bank, so from a business confidence perspective, we're also seeing that slowdown happening. And then the big turnaround has been on the consumer confidence side of things. Consumer confidence has certainly uh, dwindled significantly over the last year. Uh, and as central banks talk up in interest rates and start pushing it through, consumer behavior does start to be impacted by that. So we think that 2023 becomes less about inflation, more about economic growth. And it's a big part of our thought process in terms of portfolio positioning. We've actually been surprised that uh, economic activity has been as robust as it has for, for this year, particularly the US in terms of the labor market. It's been persistently strong over this period. A lot of negativity that I've just spoken about, um, but like all things, the market is sort of mean reverting in some regards. And certainly the one important silver lining is that through all of this, market valuations have become a lot more attractive than what they were looking, for example, 12 months ago. So if we just look very firstly, very broadly uh, at geographies across the world, the US is suddenly looking sort of fairly valued uh, compared to being quite expensive for some time. Trading, if you add the, the three indices together, and around the 17.8 times multiple, that is in line with its 10-year its historical average. The likes of Europe is looking extremely attractive, 11.2 times multiple, and the emerging markets at the same multiple, 11.2 times. So from an equity standpoint, we're certainly seeing a lot more attractive opportunities for, for those that are prepared to be long-term mindsets. Um, and then just to show you in a little bit more detail, if we break it up to that scoreboard that I showed you earlier on, the core building blocks of markets, emerging markets trading at one standard deviation below their mean, the same for developed markets, one standard deviation below their mean. We can go through the different metrics, but it's, 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 a, it's a consistent message that the markets have been rated significantly. So prices come off, but earnings haven't come off, or the, the company's fundamentals haven't deteriorated in a one-for-one -one step. Those companies' fundamentals um, have actually remained relatively speaking intact and there, therefore the market for now looks uh, attractively priced. Uh, I think if we just pause on these valuations for a second, Robert, you know, it feels like the market is starting to, to sit up and take note of this. Um, I mean, we've all been through many market sell-offs. We know that, that markets do rebound. The question is, is you know, how sharply and, and over what time period. For me, it feels like we're starting to get some days that are significantly up, you know, five, six percent days that are up, and then it will come back down again. It feels like the market's, you know, trying to uh, to, to to find a bottom and, and, and to find a direction. Uh, I'm not asking you to to call that time or to call the bottom, but just a comment from myself, um, you know, is the importance of staying in the market because if you start missing those those days that are up five, six percent. Uh, you know, over the longer period, your portfolio is going to be uh, is going to be underperforming, and you really, really do need to you know sort of batten down the hatches in times like this. You don't want to be selling uh, and locking in those losses because you just don't know when to go back in. History shows that when people do go back in, it's generally too late, and they miss miss those upticks. Yeah. So 
we'll go through just, uh, I've actually prepared one or two slides where we think it makes sense to stay invested. But to answer your question directly, I don't, well, we certainly don't know where the bottom is and I don't think anyone knows where the bottom is. But where we take comfort is that for those that are investing new money into the market right now, they're entering the market at a far more attractive level and valuations have always been a consistent measure over time in terms of wealth. And for those that are in the market right now, we would strongly argue about trying to exit because you're you, a lot of the damage that has been caused this year is already in your past. You're crystallizing those losses. Um, and at the same token, we're seeing good opportunities um, going forward where the market is certainly capable based on the, the fundamentals of achieving decent returns. Why are we seeing these big swings in the market at the moment? We're at a point where the market's trying to calibrate incoming information to that debate between growth uh, and inflation. And every time we see something that is favorable towards the growth outlook, the market responds uh, aggressively. And at the, at the same time, anything that comes in that is negative towards that backdrop, it, was, uh, it responds accordingly. Um, we do know our takeaway is that there is a marginal buyer out there at the market. Because whenever we see these negative data prints, there's someone or stepping into the market and perceiving that as sort of coming towards the end of the interest rate regime. But Unfortunately, investing is a long-term game and therefore patience is required to, to, to reap the rewards of these uh, valuations that we speak of. And we also do need to be balanced. So, you know, we can't just look at valuations blindly. We need to take a, a, an all-encompassing view towards our portfolios from a macro perspective, um, from a valuation perspective, also realizing that the earnings that we're seeing now in an economic slowdown will certain companies will be impacted um so what what is quite evident in the environment we, we go into we go into the fourth quarter earnings is we're looking for those businesses and we're looking for those managers who invest in those businesses that look for high quality because those types of companies are tend to have far more robust earnings uh, or investing companies that that do and able to sort of pass on whether it be inflation or, or slow down in demand for their product a lot better than industries and businesses that are linked to economies. So that's the takeaway. Um, the market is cheap, but the market could become cheaper if earnings rolls in. So that's that balance view that we do need to hold in this type of environment. And um, I'm gonna spend a little time on this slide because it really just takes our thoughts forward, uh, what we expect uh, going ahead. I think that delicate, trade-off between inflation and growth continues into 2023. As I mentioned, I think it starts to weigh in favor of, of growth. Um, inflation has been persistent and unrelenting over this period. Central banks have correctly hiked interest rates. There's someone in the market saying that they've overdone it. I think their mandate is not to control what the price of assets looks like. Their primary objective is to ensure that their, their economies are from an inflation point of view, under control, and then economic activity thrives accordingly. The only point to make, which I made earlier, is that what does economic growth look like 12 to 18 months forward? No one quite knows, but we need to be aware of that risk uh, as, it start, as we start approaching those dates. Uh, and we are starting to see some economic storm clouds that are appearing, that are suggesting that that impact uh, is starting to move in that direction. Our view is that we are at all the peak of inflation, at or near the peak of inflation. And what we're not saying by that statement is that we expect inflation to completely fall off a cliff and go back to pre-pandemic levels. But we think from here on out, inflation slowly grinds lower and lower. Um, the combination of weaker economic activity and higher interest rates are our reasons for believing that. Um, we also still, and I think I need to make this clear to everyone on this call, that don't expect market volatility to suddenly disappear. We are in a very, um, this balancing act and this recalibration and type of environment. So this volatility is going to continue to probably play out for the next couple of months uh, as we uh, as things become clearer to the market. So stay invested, do not over panic. The point I made earlier is the positive is that valuations are looking far more attractive. Um, and with all of this, there's an equally good reason to be positive, but there are still some risks on the table. So our message is to remain measured. We are certainly remaining measured in terms of our portfolio construction. We're not becoming overly defensive, but at the same time, we're not going overly aggressive towards asset allocations. 
we're in it for the long run. And we're certainly encouraging everyone on this call to, to generate long-term financial wealth, to stay invested. Um, now is certainly not the time to, to capitulate. This has been a very useful chart over the year because of the speed at which the sort of backdrop for economies has changed. Um, we've, as I mentioned on the last call, we were in a decade or so of this inflation type environment, the combination of globalization, technology, making things cheaper and more abundant meant that we didn't, we haven't lived in an inflation problem world for a very long time. Um, and in that type of environment, your longer duration assets, um, particularly on, on the equity side, companies that have earnings that you're buying for a long period out tend to thrive. And that's exactly what has played out over the prior decade up until sort of the end of 2021. What has been surprising is that, yes, markets move in these quadrants slowly over time, but we suddenly found ourselves in a stagflation environment. Whether they, that's down to COVID or and amplified by the Russian Ukrainian, that's behind us now. What we need to acknowledge is where we are. And we've been in this sort of tight uh, scarcity type in, environment. Now, the textbooks suggest that uh, what types of assets perform well there are US dollars, cash, and oil. And that has played out exactly to a T. Um, what we think, though, and this is probably of most value to us, is where we're going to from here. And the two probable quadrants that we think are, are likely is either we, we we stay in stagflation, but we move to a more neutral view as the wheels of economies get moving. Uh, we eventually get through the Chinese COVID headwind that they're facing. From an energy scarcity perspective, ultimately, there will be renewable energy that comes online. And we could very well find ourselves back in a, a disinflation type environment in time to come. So those are our two probable outcomes. Um, and, and obviously comes into our, in our thought process from an investment standpoint. The least likely is boom times where you see high inflation and high growth because we think central banks will have to compromise slightly higher inflation for slightly lower growth. So that's the world we think we live in uh, for, I don't want to say for the next decade, but certainly for the next couple of years. A big part of our process is on a quarterly basis. We have a strategic long-term asset allocation view. And you know, I've described this to some people on the score. If you were to give me $100 to make the once-off investment for a balanced portfolio, that would be our strategic view. That's based on 20 years' behavior of asset classes and how they correlate together. We use the principles of mean burns optimization to do that. But then what we do on a quarterly basis is we sit around a table and we formulate how do we want to be tactically and or overweight relative to those calls. Um, and to share with everyone, our view going into the fourth quarter for now on the emerging markets perspective, whilst over long periods, we would actually prefer to be slightly underweight. We're holding a neutral view there. I think the combination of um, potentially some of the headwinds loosening up uh, coming from China, as well as where valuations are, we think that's sensible to be neutral now. From a developed market standpoint, we're neutral. We're measured between the risks as well as the opportunity set. Uh, valuations are an important consideration. And collectively with the equities, we don't want to be overweight. So that's why we're holding a neutral, neutral emerging developed core. On the property, we've downweighted our view to slightly underweight. Um, we think weaker economic activity, higher interest rates are two significant headwinds to the sector, and hence our view to be slightly underweight there. Probably the big move that we're making for the quarter is we've been sitting large, we've been big underweights on the bond segment of the portfolio. So what we prefer to do there is be neutral equities and overweight cash as opposed to the bond positioning. We think that bonds have spiked and we think that where we are today, suddenly getting sort of three and a half, four, even four and a half percent return on the bonds coupled with the fact that if economic activity does slow, interest rates will ultimately start coming down again with their capital appreciation, um, they're starting to become a lot more sensible. So what we're looking to do is use some of that overweight cash like in the portfolio and start to increase our positioning in bonds to a more neutral view. So that is, for me, the more big structural move that's taking place in the, over the quarter. And then for the, for the other pieces um, from an inflation protection Commodities, as I showed earlier, 10 years haven't produced returns. They've been fantastic in a very short period, but we think the horse is bolted there. We think no one will be buying commodities now. 
we prefer to have some protection through the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities or TIPS in the portfolios. So that's our asset allocation view. Uh, obviously, we formulate this now. If anything significant happens intra quarter, we have the flexibility to, to adjust accordingly. And then I thought, you know, within all of this, it's always good to go back to why are we invested and why do we go about things um, and why ultimately markets are able to produce decent returns for clients. And certainly this year doesn't feel like that. Um, but let's just spend three slides on the sort of thesis for staying invested and why it's good to buy higher growth companies. So I think this year, the, the lower, more defensive companies have significantly outperformed the higher growing companies. And when I'm talking about higher growing, I'm not talking about their share price, I'm talking about their earnings growth over an extended period of time. This chart just looks at uh, the All Country World Index. It goes back to 1997, so we've got a meaningful amount of data here. And it places companies' earnings in quintiles. So the highest growing companies from an earnings perspective find themselves in the first quintile from a performance perspective. They've achieved an annualized return of 17% per year. The second quintile, you come in at 13%, annualized return 10, 5. And those slow growing companies have actually lost clients money over that period of time. They've gone, they've lost 1% per year. Um, what has happened this year? The complete opposite. The higher growing companies are down 29%. Those poor or weaker growing companies are, are down 11%. So they're still down, but they're, they're protected. Benefit. Now, our message to clients is, you know, we focus on the, the stronger companies, whether that be from a quality or growth perspective. Uh, over extended periods, it certainly produces results. But unfortunately, in these, in these environments, there are the drawdowns that come with it. Secondly, it's sort of a, an age-old slide to always remind clients in these types of environments is the importance of staying invested. Um, if we look at the S&P 500 over since the 90s, 1990 to 2021, and if you were someone who had just stayed invested through everything that's happened over those uh, 20, 30 odd years, whether it be the dot-com financial crisis, the Asian emerging crisis, which still had an impact, and the COVID, your annualized return in dollars would have been 9.9%. If you had missed just five of the best days in the market over that 30 odd year period, your return would be significantly diminished by a negative, your ultimate return was negative 4.1%. The difference between five days can be very significant in your portfolio. And then the question always posed to me is we get that and we understand, but what if we miss the worst day and then we and then we get back in? And in theory, that would be your, your return would be significantly enhanced. But the reality is that's virtually impossible to do. Because what you're looking at behind me is just a chart over time, a timeline representing the clusters of the worst days and the best days. And unfortunately, the worst and the best days tend to happen at the same time. So you don't have a period of really bad days and then a sort of a period of stability and a period of good days. Those bad days come and all those good days come in between the bad days. The bad days represented by sort of the black dots and the good days, the orange dots. So other than anyone, most people in the market, which we believe can't time, the ability to be in and out and in and out, somewhere along the line, you're going to miss those few good days and therefore end up with that negative return that I've spoken about. And then the last one that um, just hopefully provides some enc encouragement to stay invested is that what, and there's no guarantee, but certainly what we've seen in the past is often when we've gone through a drawdown, the, the rebound or the response thereafter is outsized returns. So I need to say that I'm not by any way suggesting this is going to happen this time. But this is certainly what's happened over the last nine or 10 times before, since the 1960s. Whenever the market has had a drawdown in dollar terms of around 25% um, or more, so on average 38%, the subsequent year has rebounded by 27%. And for those that have stayed invested for three years, have received a return of 45%. Um, so that's our message. Hopefully I've provided some um, clarity as to what's happening. As always, if any of you need to speak to your advisor, we're here for, for Carrick and we, we certainly are providing this information to them. And from my side, thank you very much for the opportunity just to provide this feedback. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. We've got, uh, 
time for just a couple of questions, but thank you for providing that context. You always do have a, a very good way of simplifying things for certain for, for my mind to understand all the all the different dynamics that are going on, on in this particular market at one point in time. It's really, really a difficult, uh, difficult time. Um, so the, the one question that came through, which is, has been on my mind as well, is that it's the strength of the US dollar. Yeah. Um, you know, whether you're sitting in, in the UK in, in sterling or sitting in, in, a, in an emerging market currency, the, the story has been pretty consistent. The dollar yeah. strength. Yeah. And the question is really, is it, you know, where, what is your view on the dollar? Is it going to, at some point in time, weaken? How do you position it? Yeah. So the drive behind the dollar over this year has been we've moved from negative real yields in the U.S. to very quickly positive real yields. And also, if you compare the U.S. to other economies, they've almost had an easier runway or more leverage to hike interest rates. If you compare that to Europe, i.e. the euro, because of what's taking place on their continent, they've been limited in the ability to, to hike interest rates because the scarring of economic growth would be more significant. The Japanese economy or the yen, they haven't, they haven't dealt with how they haven't hiked interest rates, they haven't felt it necessary. So that relative interest rate has just widened with the US significantly. And then from a UK perspective, um, similar message coupled with a change in leadership. So all things told that money that you put in the US bank account versus a, a Japanese bank account, a European bank account has favored the US and therefore you send this, this drive towards the dollar. Second to that is obviously the dollar has always been the reserve currency of the world and seems to be the safe haven. So you've had this very strong push in that direction. Um, how long that persists, time will tell. So we certainly don't want to be calling the swing, but we think that the dollar has certainly for someone who's looking for an opportunity to buy pounds, we think it's a favorable level or euro. We just think that the dollar may have over-strengthened um, in, in the environment here. But the, the hard part to answer is how long does this persist? Thank you very much for that answer. And then the, the next question is around sort of supply chain bottlenecks. Um, we, we, we've got China, you know, that's still with the locking down. We've got Ukraine. Uh, Russia war that seems to be escalating again. Um, I was reading recently that the, the waterways of the U.S. and Mississippi rivers, you know, drying up, and and there's, there's massive bottlenecks there. So yes, inflation or high interest rates should 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 bring down the demand side. But what's happening on the supply side? Yeah. Can give us some context there. So I think the easier one to answer is China. China is a significant supplier of the world. Um, China is almost from an economic standpoint, two years behind the rest of the world, particularly developed markets, they're dealing with significant um, COVID headwinds. And also from a policy standpoint, that zero COVID policy and lockdowns have been severe. So that has certainly worked against um, creating excess supply in the economy. Um, we were in uncertain times from a COVID perspective. Our view is that we need to look at what happened to the rest of the world. We think that ultimately COVID does ease up in China and as a result, the economy gets going. I think from a leadership perspective, they also incentivize to, to pick up economic activity and the economic growth has been weak. So that is our view going forward into 2023. From the energy crisis, um, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that COVID-26, the world is moving towards renewable energy sources. We understand that global warming um, is significant for some of the reasons you've mentioned and that particularly developed economies are going to move away from fossil fuel reliance. The challenge though is because of what's transpired in Russia, those economies have been caught without a solution. Yet. But ultimately, if we look through this three, five years, 10 years out, energy dependence by certain countries has been scarred as a result of this. And we think the likes of Germany, Scandinavian countries will be less will not want to find themselves in that position again. So five, 10 years out, energy could actually be in abundance. And then we've seen oil price get up to might very well be the last time that oil is able to trade in the hundreds because they're competing against other technologies. So that, and then the third point is, if the economics activity slows, ultimately it means that demand somewhere along the line is loosened up. So yeah, we think those bottlenecks from the supply demand 
which we got we moved completely out of sync during COVID, you eventually find more normal equilibrium that we're accustomed to. Thank you for that. And uh, I guess it comes down to whether you believe humans, you know, uh, evolve and, and innovate. And I think with technology, uh, you know, I certainly believe that, uh, that that we will find a way forward. And I look forward to having this call with uh, with you next quarter when you know Touchwood markets have uh, have gone up, and it will be an easier call for for all all parties concerned. But Rob, thank you very much for your time to all the listeners. Thank you very much. I hope that you found it useful. Um, as Rob mentioned, please reach out to your advisor or, or, or Rob or I if you want some more context or have further questions. Um, otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.